Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. Got Uncle Rob Liefeld in the house, man, for a part two of our conversation about that New Mutants era. Uh, New Mutants issue number 98 is going to be under the microscope. First appearance of Deadpool. Jimmy, go get grab my issue, man. Like, we just need to show off that. We got thousands of dollars worth of comics up in this bitch, man. Give me, look at these <laughs> things. Thousands of dollars worth of comics. All raw. I love it, guys. And you know what? Look at how I'm reading this one, man. <laughs> I'm dog ear in mind because comics are meant to be read, baby. This is going to be what we hear about in the comments if you're not careful there. <laughs> That's Ed. got that right. <laughs> um, to, to set the stage here, we're coming off of the Extinction Agenda. Yes. So it's been almost a year since the introduction of Cable, and now we are basically going off of a crossover, and, and now Rob Liefeld in credit control on the New Mutants, starting with issue 98. Rob, before we jump into things with this issue, let the people know about Rob's observations. Hey, everybody. Um, I have a podcast. I'd love for you to listen to it. It's called Rob's Observations. It's on Apple. It's on Spotify. It's on Podbean. It's everywhere. I talk comics. Um, people tell me all the time that uh, they listen to me and they watch this show. I guess they're great companion pieces. It's I, I, I talk about comics since I bought them in 1974 as an old you know, fossil in the Wild West. Uh, and, and I just walk you through my experience as a fan and as a pro and all the stuff in between. And so I'd invite you to listen to that. Thank you. We got an iconic cover that we're looking at right here with uh, new mutants 98, but you, you've been putting some gems out on your social media. Uh, we got to get into this Venn uh, yeah. letter, but, uh, there was a splash page or was no, it was a cover for, cover. uh, for a uh, blood strike. That was uh, a rough, a thumbnail that could yes. have been a New Mutants cover. That's right, and it 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 diminished your 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 money maker, man. It was it was Deadpool getting kicked in the jibs by somebody. That's right. That's right. So, uh, yeah, it's, speak it's on getting that. By Domino, no, Domino is kicking Deadpool, and the rest of the team is tied up. That's the sketch. That was the original sketch. Right. I made the right choice. Yes, yes, yeah. First impressions are a big thing, man. And what is cool? What make what's cooler, right? Like you got Deadpool standing there with a knife and a gun, or getting kicked in the jibs. Yeah, and also no, like I'm, it's so clear there's new characters being introduced. And again, this is one I bought off the newsstand. Absolutely, I was excited already. Big fan of the book at this point, but just new characters. You know, like there's such an energy from that. I uh, the the energy from that had transformed this book. I I trust me. I was gambling everything I had, Jim and Ed. I mean, again, I, I can go back to this time very clearly. And and by this time, now Jim has been on the X-Men about a year and he is running away with the favor of the X-Men fans. Uh, Todd's got his new Spider-Man book. Um, I'm just trying to keep up and not get left behind. That is, uh, as I said to you guys in another episode, uh, that when, when we chatted this period for me, I was in demand, had tons of work, kept turning down work. DC Comics was calling me as well to come back and do stuff for them. But at the end of the day, uh, it wasn't about me now at this point keeping a job. It was, I got to keep up with with the hottest guys in comics and I don't want to get left behind. And <clears throat> I was promised that had Cable taken with the readers that I would be able to uh, write the book. Now, I, I writing a book entails, you know, character creation, character interaction, obviously the plot, the 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 threat of the character, all of the interdimensional interactions. I mean, with with the characters and expanding them. I just didn't have time to make dialogue, and this was a time where when I was growing up, a lot of guys. We're getting people to dialogue. When when George Perez took over Wonder Woman, Len Wein scripted his stories. He did not do the initial dialogue. This was uh, something that had been modeled for me, and it was getting more and more popular, especially with the Marvel model, because even in the early books that I bought in the 70s, one guy would plot it, one guy would script it. So I just said, I just need to dictate the story completely and be able to... Uh, really kind of pick up what I had started in New Mutants 87 and now just push it on through. And you mentioned we had lost all these months to the mandatory crossover, of which I only did breakdowns for. Yes. Like I, I said, I can't. Bob really wanted me to hang on and do at least two of the three issues. And uh, because I saw how my layouts 
were being interpreted in the first chapter. But I got to be honest, I gave everything I could to those layouts, but they were layouts. But still, the, the New Mutants was not the focus of the Extinction Agenda. The X-Men were the focus of the Extinction Agenda. All the cool bits were going to be happening in that book. I knew it ahead. We were like a side platter. And who wants to be carrots? You know, I, I didn't I didn't feel like being the carrots of the story. That, that story could have almost been told without the New Mutant chapters whatsoever. So I opted to miss the entire third chapter, but but I did pencil, I even penciled and inked pages in the second chapter. What that would be New Mutants, I think 96. I even penciled and inked pages. Ironically, and Todd McFarlane is my house at that time because he's on a game show that weekend. He was a little tidbit. He's on what's my not what's my line, but like three people tell that they're a taxi driver, and you have to guess which one is the taxi driver. Right. He he was was trying to convince people that he was a taxi driver that took a guy from New York to Los Angeles. And I'm like, why are you doing this? And he's like, sounds like fun. I love game shows. But in between, <laughs> on Friday and Saturday, he came and hung out with me. And I, I was inking pages from 96, warming up, because I knew I was going to pencil and ink my own work here. But yeah, I opted out of that extinction agenda because it just didn't offer anything to me. And, and, and I needed to focus completely on this and load this. Because look, man... When you ask to become the writer at Marvel, you better deliver. And I had already, now I need to really double down and 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 we had just, as I'm doing this issue, I had won the vote to get it transformed to X-Force. But whether it was going to get transformed to X-Force or not, the book was going to change. So X-Force really played into how I ended New Mutants 100. But I was always introducing all these characters at this time to further change the dynamic. And I know, like you said, new characters can generate a ton of excitement. And people always go, like, here's the deal. It'd be one thing if Deadpool is standing where Gideon is. But I'm like, Deadpool's out in the front. He's front and center. He's important. There, He is pulling your focus. He is pulling your focus. Uh, Joseph in his amazing Technicolor dream coat was always going to be in the background, okay? He's my more biblical character. He even has a biblical name. And then Domino is well placed in the composition but like i always tell people two out of three ain't bad two of these characters went the distance that that that's a that that's a great ratio i still have my gideon figure man so so he you know he got his license deal no no doubt um when you take a powder from the extinction agenda stuff uh do you know that you got a double-sized issue 100 are you just working on this material uh, issue, wow, 100, on. issue 100 is double sized marketing has already said double sized I, I know it and I'm, I'm embracing it I can do it at this point man I am locked in this is all I have going on in my life so this is I what you're working on while the extinction agenda stuff is happening you're just uh, while they're wrapping so, so <clears throat> because I did layouts yeah on 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 uh 95 95 I got I was able to start then, because I didn't like the way that stuff was looking and my name was on it, I fully penciled half of 96. And Art to Bear, I asked him to ink it, and he did some of that because I figured, crap, you know, New Mutant 98 is a long ways away. So I've got to, and I, I was really happy with the stuff that I fully penciled in 11 by 17, just to kind of keep myself in the conversation in the best possible way. But my contribution to issue 97. People ask me this all the time. If I had one cover I could have back, that's the cover. Cable and Wolverine, freaking A, that cover. And so many people have told me, I bought that comic just for that cover. Um, <clears throat> I mean, that is, and it's unconventional. They're both shooting off to the side, but it was just me fully going like, I am just gonna, this is all I have to give this comic. So I'm gonna give Cable in all his glory, biggest ass shoulder pads, big ass gun. I don't think, yeah, Cable... The cable on the cover to New Mutants 97 is how Cable looks on the cover to X-Force 1. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the debut of that look. Right. And uh, and then Wolverine, battle damage. Um, but yeah, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm starting to just try and buy every moment I can to prepare this and knowing I have the double size issue as well. But like literally, like I told you guys, and I'm making the book and I'm going to ink myself. So I've added multiple layers to my responsibilities. Right. Okay. But uh, 
Oh man, I I still dig this page. How I does, love this page. How does your uh, your process change with inking? Uh, we looked at with you in the past. We looked at uh, Young Blood number six. Where you give a little scoop into how you work. You got the uh, post-it well, you know, notes Blood, and you blow up. Yeah. So I still I'm still doing the blow ups. Uh, everything is tiny, drawn tiny, and then either myself or someone I pay would transfer my lines. Uh, you know, so then they, they could hand them off to me and I could then go and fully render everything that I had already laid down. But, you know, Youngblood 6 is all the figures are inked by Danny Mickey. So <clears throat> this is all, except for, I think, one page by Joe Rubenstein in here is all my inks. And, uh, but it's still the same. Marat now is fully, uh, you know, a year into it is is got his role as my assistant. I do these, I ink these. These aren't penciled. I ink the small eight and a half by 11s of which I've shown on social media. I have all these. I have so many of these. I have new mutants 98. I, I, I put two in auction. Um, you know, so, so I ink these up. Then Marat would, we had a, a copy machine in, in the, in the office. It was my big expenditure. Uh, we, we spent, <laughs> we, we would, you would think of Zoolander um, when they're trying to break into the computer uh, in the third act with, with Marat and I trying, we were trying and, and Marat was all on board. It would have cost him his job. But in, in 1990, we're, we're, we're calling out different Xerox copy salesmen. We just want a copy machine that will feed an 11 by 17 sheet through and print blue ink, which is what now every Epson printer does, you know, default. But at the time, man, we're trying to push technology. I'm calling Jim Lee. Can you guys do this down in San Diego? Uh, you know, but uh, Marat's job was secure. The reason he he was excited about it because he would have done it for his work too. It'd have been like, oh shit, I'm drawing my stuff and send it through the Rob's copier. But Marat would take my little drawings, blow them up, and just stack them, and then I'm inking them. And the best that I can tell you is he would, you know, rule our panel borders and fill in as many blacks as I could give him, but we're rolling that. That is the process he has to me as an assistant. And I mean, literally somebody to help to assist, get the job done, get it over the finish line. That's, that's fascinating, man. What are you uh, inking with at this time, Rob? Hunt 102, the Hunt 102 crow quill. It's all I know. Um, technical pins have no flexibility. And I knew that I wanted to get that flexibility. Those, uh, the, the pages that I spoke of in New Mutants 96 uh, that I inked towards the latter part of the the, the the issue, I inked those in technical pen and saw that that's not going to do it for me. It has no flow. So I am uh, all in on the Hunt 102. And later on, as I'm leaving X-Force, I'm using a 107 as well. But all of this is just indie ink, dip ink. I, got, I have a giant drafting table that I'm inking this stuff on. <clears throat> and uh, I mean, it's super fun. Again, like here's four pages to a character you've never seen before, you know, but I had earned the trust of the fans because, you know, look, let me give you something. Larry Houston, who is the producer of the story X-Men animated series and of the new X-Men 97 coming on Disney plus <clears throat> Larry comes up to me in the green room 2019 right before the pandemic and uh it was november december 2019 and says hey man i'm your guy i'm the reason cable was in the x-men animated series so much buddy he goes i love that character man i i, I just i always hope we did you proud and i've i've heard you talk i said larry hugged him thank you thank you um he talked to me and contacted me when 97 was getting you know back up and then i spoke to him again at the X-Men 60th anniversary thing uh, that we did with Marvel, he was in the green room uh, as well. I, I, I talked to Mark Silvestri, I talked to Larry. The point is, whether it's the game designers, the animators, the, the people who produce the big X-Men series, they associate me with these characters. First, foremost, always, for a reason. Because they know that when they were reading comics, something changed. There was a seismic shift in the book. There was one name that wasn't there before. And suddenly everything was reflecting what happened. Like I said, there's there's BL and AL. <laughs> Sounds like a sandwich, you know. And 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 BL was 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 struggling, you know. But we took off the training wheels after almost a hundred issues, and and we 
we we got the afterburners. And to those people who say, oh man, because I, I I love to do this, you know, I, I'm, I'm giving this platform. Liefeld, you ruined the new mutants. I'm so glad that I ruined the new mutants. <laughs> if that's your viewpoint, I'm so happy that I was able to do that for you. Rob, do you remember the numbers uh, sales-wise on New Mutants 98? Oh, baby, baby. We're at 650, 680. It's, it's around there. We have we have jumped into... Uh, no, no, no. There, look, you guys, I, I think there's a... I wasn't winning the argument enough to warrant X-Force yet, um, but I think I started to turn... Because I knew, I, I also, when I got on the New Mutants, I had pre-negotiated that Cable would fight Wolverine very quickly. But we had to, back in the day, Claremont had to agree to it. The editor said, I need to talk to Chris and see how this works out. Chris has, you know, first say in the character. I don't know what incentives or whatever they had to give him to let him us have him for New Mutants 93, 94, but I know... Wolverine, because I knew if I can get Wolverine to fight Cable and to have one bit of line that says he recognizes him, which was 100% implemented, had to be there, wasn't there in the first pass, said, whoa, 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 this right here has to be in here. It's more, they have to know each other because then that would give my character more importance. And, uh, and, and then I think Marvel was like, wow, this is there's something going on here. And then I think they were like, we've already greenlit it, but now boy, my life changed with this issue. I, I was treated differently. I was now um, more important. Um, and, and trust me, <clears throat> by the time this is released, they're getting the numbers on new mutants 100. And that's when Bob said, Rob, you've blown by all of our, uh, we, we had sales. Uh, what do you call it? You know, uh, th th they had, anticipated sales figures and, and and people i tell people all the time new means 100 no no scratch and sniff no acetate cover no glow in the dark no no ex it's just a comic that's it it's just a comic and uh and we achieved that on fan excitement so six six eighty six six fifty we have now added half a hundred we've added at least half a million sales to this book it's blowing by x factor it's blowing by the only thing it's looking up at is is the dynamo. You know, it's the X-Men itself. So tell us about that letter that you showed off on uh, your social media uh, from Sven, who must be like the longest employed Marvel em employee at this point. Unless That's... there's a couple of Svens because I've dealt with Sven. Yeah, yeah me too. Well, me I've too. just uh, so so the artist I'm, an artist edition of mine is coming. And, and it's because I went once again back to Sven. Yes, no, Sven is the man. Sven hooked me yeah. up, man. Like I put a, 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 a fan of graphics calls it studio edition, but I negotiated with him. Like, let me get some of my X-Men pages for, for my joint. Boom. <laughs> yeah, there Boom. it is. Boom. Boom. The double so, fister. Uh, good, good on you. Yeah, no, I think, uh, so look, man, I've told the story. I can tell you guys right here. I, I The day Todd Spider-Man came out was my one, Spider-Man number one, summer of 1990, I decide finally that I am going to try this speculation thing that I see everyone else in my life doing. <clears throat> I'm I'm making comics, but can I flip a comic on the same day or on the same weekend? Well, I had heard that there was a store that overordered everything down in um, Anaheim, California. I store is now closed. It was called Beach Ball Comics. I drove down there. I mean, it it looked like a hoarder's house, and there were cats. And I was like, but there in multiple stacks were like stacks of probably 60, 60, 60, maybe more of each of Todd's editions. I think there were four editions, bagged, unbagged, uh, silver, you know, whatever there was. I bought 40 of each and I drove up to Fullerton. It was about three o'clock in the afternoon. And I go and see this one store that I didn't particularly like. Uh, uh, the, the gentleman has passed away and the store is closed. But I walked in and they have no Spider-Man number ones. They're they're sold out at three o'clock on Friday when the book comes out. Because again, for the audience, at this point, comics don't come out on Wednesdays. They come out on Fridays. And uh, <clears throat> I said, hey man, it's going to be a long weekend. No Spider-Mans. And he's like, yeah, I'm not going to have any until next week. I go, I, I, I got whatever you need in the car. I'm like a dealer. I'm like a dealer. 
dealer and I'm drawing comics, but it was so fun. And he's like, what are you selling for? I said, uh, I'll give him to you for cover price. No, I, I said, I'll give him to you a 50, 50 cent over cover. Cause I'm a, I'm, I'm a, I'm a nice guy. He's like, oh man, I'm going to get those at cost. I go, you're not going to have them all weekend long and you're going to look bad and they're going to go to other stores. And he goes, I'll take, I'll take 30 of each. Went into my car, got 30, 30, 30, 30, walked in. He wrote me a check and I literally went, it's that easy? That, wow. I mean, I just drove to one city, drove to another and, and I had a minor markup. Why am I wasting your time telling you this? I am so satisfied with my flipping. I pull into the garage at my apartment. I go upstairs. The phone rings. The hot summer sun is coming in. It's 4, 15, 4, 30. It's Jim Lee. Obviously, didn't have a cell phone, had one of those cord phones, but it goes like this. I hey, well, hey, hello, Rob, it's Jim. Uh huh. Uh, I'm next. It's me. It's me. I'm next. And I'm like, what does this mean? And he goes, ne next summer, X Men number one. It's me. I I I'm getting the Spider Man treatment. I almost uh, passed out, vomited simultaneously. Um, I dropped to my bed, like my ass hit that bed. And I was like, oh, great. <laughs> and so I'm like, wow, what am I going to do? <laughs> like, I've already seen what's happened to Todd. Spider-Man went from selling, you know, 700,000 copies to selling millions, right? Changed. How do I get in on that, guys? How do I get in on that? Well, I've got a book that is kicking all sorts of ass. Sales have turned around. New Mutants is a big deal. I... I immediately call Marvel. Hey, and and trust me, man, it was like a guy serving me notice. Like you're getting left behind, Mofo. Um, that that's how I took it. Like we we aren't competing anymore. I'm out of here. The limo's picking me up in 12 months. So in that letter that I told that that you mentioned that I share, because people have really misinterpreted. Because trust me, the truth is right there. Um, people ask me, why didn't it happen sooner? Here, I've got it right here. The, the, this is the Instagram post with from Sven. And it's like, I'm going to talk. Where is it? He, he mentions he's going to talk to Jim. There's no other Jim he's talking to than Jim Lee. They had to get Jim Lee to agree to this. Because I think um, I also spoke to Jim yesterday. And he had some interesting comments about this. I wasn't working for no gym, okay? Bob Harris is my editor. His assistant is Susan. The editor in chief is Tom DeFalco. There's no, there's no, there's no gym. Jim Galton is not being bothered by this. And I don't even think he's there anymore. Okay. So three times I got turned, two times I got turned down. It was submitted. We could turn Rob's new mutants into executioners. We could launch. I got to know, Rob, I hate to break. This is the facts he sent me after the phone call because I was like, oh my gosh. You know, I had a summertime no. I mean, again, I am told that this is happening the day because Marvel's like, we're going to do this again next year. We'll do this with X-Men. Well, we, we can continue to show sales dominance. You guys, I worked my ass off to not be left behind. That That's, and, and, uh, and I think I just kept making a compelling uh, you look, I, I'll tell you who told me I had five trading cards. It wasn't Sven. Jim Lee called me on a weekend. Hey, man, yeah, I, I don't know if you've heard, but you're getting five trading cards. Dudes, Jim was running. He was just shy of running Marvel Comics, okay? <laughs> it sounds um, like it. <laughs> uh, I, I, I had asked if I could do a wraparound, like, fold-out cover like he had on X-Men 75. He said, you're getting the trading cards. I'm getting five connecting covers that are going to make one image. I mean, no, Bob Harris did not tell me that. Uh, I, I kind of feel like they were telling me like, as if it was a downgrade. I feel like I'm like, hell yeah, I'll take the trading cards. Shit. Howdy. Yes. Look, I had already seen new mutants. 100 sold a million copies. They went back to press immediately. Unlike other reprints that was going back regularly. They could not. That's why there's a purple, a gold, a silver. I mean, it just kept selling out. Double-sized issue. Made a ton of money for Marvel. And that's what it was all about. I was making money for the publisher. I could 
I could continue to make my, uh, you know, sales pitch based on the success that the book had. And by the time New Mutants 98 comes out, I think they like, we look like geniuses because now it's got the green light. When this is in your hands, that's happening. Yeah. But right up during the Extinction Agenda, it is still up in the air. Extinction Agenda comes out fall of 1990. I get the decision to go forward in the middle of Extinction Agenda. So I just think they had already seen like, and you guys, I'm going to tell you, Everybody in my business at the time, when a new book came out, you went and did a store signing. My signings were becoming crazy from 80 people to 250 people to I, I can't get through these 500 people today. Like, I, I'm going to have to be here all weekend. Like, the, the it was legitimate generational excitement for this book. So I was, um, and that was affirming that all my correction, all my instincts were being rewarded. Again, because look at the title I'm doing. My book is an X book. There's no X in this book. It's the new freaking mutants. Bird brain. Caw! Caw! <laughs> All right. That that letter is just that's a, it's such a fascinating document because uh, it's it's Ven. It's it's a, it's a sales guy, and there's some talk in that piece in the text about like we're gonna try this again, but at some point. At some point, it's going to fall through, like like the speculation stuff of, of like having new number ones and stuff. So like it might be super dicey to be the number three guy on, on that mix, man. But we see yeah. how history played out. And then from there, you know, I don't know what the next number one was after uh, X-Men, but it must have been Wonder Man or a Silver Sable or some <laughs> shit like that. And it just doesn't. Uh, no, I, I remember in my mind, in the immediate aftermath, I, it, it, you know, I don't know if it's in, in the immediate aftermath, but it was there. And I was, I was part of it because I was, I was, I have four, um, I haven't shared them yet, but I was one of the guys that was asked to submit um, character designs for the new Luke Cage, what they were just going to call Cage. Right. You remember that first issue has an acetate, like animated cell cover. Yeah. And, and I think that's when Marvel realized we can get money out of it. We're, we're actually spending more money now for some of these gimmicks. And we're not getting the traction and that, you know, to go three, five, eight and to not get to one again for a long time says something about the product. It's not everything can have a scratch and sniff put on it. Right. Right. So, so, so uh, Rob, you've been using a, a Hunt 102. When you use a yeah. Hunt 102 for a little while, man, it gets that, you could get that kind of blunt line, a thicker line. I, yes. That's a thick line I see here. But then when we flip the page, you see so many thin lines. So do you think that this is like a brand new 102 or something? Um, it, it's, it, so, so I'm going to tell you right now, this Scott Williams, uh, inker of X-Men with Jim Lee in that story, uncanny to me, their, their career best work. Uh, he spoke when their artist edition came out, how terrible the printing was. Mm. You are looking, I don't know what happened to this film, but if you were to look at the original, it does not reflect this, these two pages. Right. It's like the film is bad or, or the, 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 whatever files they submitted. I mean, so what you're seeing, I'm, I'm like, I look at the, 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 the lines that did make it through, but th this face this face, this hand, it, and look, you got bad plates all the time. And, and I would learn about this man, George Perez, who came out to Southern California all the time. He would lose it. the printing on crisis on infinite earths. Like the first six issues was driving him crazy because DC was trying a new and, and, and stuff would drop out. So we were all victim. I did not know for years that Scott Williams was like, we had every other line drop out on the X-Men. Mm. So, Remember, these are being printed by the guy who won with the lowest bid. Right. Um, and, and, and that's what you <laughs> So, but yeah, now now this is, uh, this next page worked out real nice. Yeah, it, yeah, it absolutely did. It's, it's back to business as usual. Yeah. You know, you're um, so right, because it's a signature thing. I think that, like, we might see some signatures where it's just, it's, it's that way. I'm surprised Which, it's well, not inconsistent from our copy to yours, Rob. You know, I mean, like the, the printing is. Oh, for so sure, for sure. No, no, but they're both. Time. No, no, I've never seen it printed well. It's like it just got a bad scan, or whoever was doing it just didn't give a shit. Now, this page you turned to, that's Joe Rubenstein. Mm. So that's Joseph Rubenstein. Um, 
and and I guess he gets a pretty good royalty just off this page. Um, because uh, he's like, yeah, hey, I got another check from New Mutants '98, man. I love every time they go back to press with that. And I'm like, you did one page, like, but they're they, that's where they're good about the itemizations. I get checks. You know, I only did three pages of Spider-Man, but I get those omnibus and those reprint checks too. And I'm like, hot damn. Yeah, man. Getting that, you know? getting that royalty off like a hundred dollar book. Man, that's some sexy, sexy stuff. Yeah. When you update uh Cannonball's outfit, uh, yes. you, you got to get approvals for that. And sure. do you have to do a number of sketches or is this like the first thought you had in mind? Well, uh, I had submitted everybody with different color coding. Um, mm-hmm. Look, I was a big Legion of Superheroes fan. And uh, I loved a lot of the, I just, I loved kind of the color. Sunboy was like red, uh, you know, Lightning Lad was blue and yellow. So I was trying to just give everybody a different color, but I was literally going for aviator guy, you know, yeah. I think Art Adams had put him in a full like motorcycle helmet. And I'm like, uh, that's not working for me. I want to draw his face, but I want to do like the, you know, aviator guy. And so they they were quick to like I said I I I, I tried to um. I, I, this isn't exaggerating what happened. I just got yeses on everything. Right. I've said. I don't remember being told no. I, I was always like, yeah, let's do it, let's do it, let's do it. Sounds great. They didn't understand why it was working. Right. Um. They didn't understand why people were rallying and and to this new group. Uh. I mean, look. Todd drew big hair. I drew big hair. Jim drew big hair. I've looked back. Eric Larson may have drawn the biggest hair of all. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> he went to a different club to see his girls. Cartoonist Kayfabe is brought to you by the comics that we make. My next book is Street Angel, Princess of Poverty. It'll be out later this spring from Image Comics and collects all of the Street Angel comics that are not in Deadliest Girl Alive, also available from Image Comics. Get those two volumes. You'll have the complete series of Street Angel, at least up to this point. You can also pick up my latest Hulk Grand Design in a handsome treasury-sized edition with a fluorescent green cover. Can't miss that, although it is going fast. So if you want a copy, pick that one up soon. And The Plain Janes, my young adult graphic novel with Cecil Castellucci. Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus coming out 2023. Put in your pre-orders now. I, it's it's going for like 55 bucks or something on Amazon. Going to be 75 when it comes out. So lock in your price, uh, lock in your pre-order at that price. Also, Red Room Crypto Killers is coming out uh, in May. This is the cover for issue number one by yours truly. Banned to 26 countries, banned in a half dozen or so comic shops. Bunch of other flavors of covers for that comic. Man, there's the Peach Momoko variant. Jim Rugg by way of Rob Liefeld via Youngblood with his variant, the Ed Piscor variant cover, and the Red Room Crypto Killers sketch cover that anybody can order at any time for uh, this first round of uh, new Red Room comics. And if you draw something on this, make sure you tag me in it so that I can take a look, share it on my social medias. And now back to Rob Liefeld. Again, look, these two pages just sold for enormous amounts of money. And there, there's nothing happening that in terms of historic importance, but these are really fun storytelling pages, right? Totally. Because I'm like, you're setting up your next comic, man. Like, uh, yeah, you, you're. We're gonna learn that Gideon is behind this. And yes, it's a, it's a big part of uh, X Force. This is I'm doing my my soap opera stuff. I gotta off Roberto because I want him out of the book. And so I got to, I got to get rid of his dad and get this all going. And I, you know, I love here, you know, here's your cup. It's poison. You're dead. Uh, I mean, I, I love that fourth panel, man. He, he's dying right there, right yeah, there. Dude. That's, that's the power of gesture and white space, negative space. Good stuff. Was there a, uh, were you able to do everything you needed to with the Gideon character? Or were you building to something more before no, you no. split off? No, uh, no. They didn't like Gideon. Uh, I was, as I made Gideon bigger, you know, I don't know who didn't like him. I don't know if the scripter didn't like him. I won't say his name. I don't know if if the, uh, if the uh, Bob Harris didn't like him. But I was told, didn't like him. That page sold for $100,000. Here's why this is uh, last year in Heritage. There are no shoulder pads. There are no pockets. Uh, there is no Deadpool on this page. 
There is no guns, no ammo, no no sword. This with cable blowing back, because here's the deal. Right before when it, it was like 35, my family will tell you I was upstairs watching this on the laptop, and then I am running through the house. Oh, it's at 60. It's at, oh, I'm coming downstairs. It's at 75. Oh, shit. I get down to the It's at 80. Shit. It's one of those off the hook. You like don't even expect it. And then it's like 90, 92 with premium, 100. You're like, what? Um, and that told me like, again, guys, uh, l- let's go to this. I know the, the, the man who owns this has turned down with an S millions, yeah. millions for this cover. Um, this art now is as valuable as you can possibly imagine in, in the scheme. And when I say this art, this era, it's not just me, obviously it's right. Todd, it's him, it's me, but you know, it's, uh, but, but again, let me, let me tell you this. So I'm laying these out. There's a reason that she's your eye goes here. And then your eye goes here. I mean, this works because I would be calling them going, I don't want an ad here. I need these pages to work across from each other. There's a diametric aspect to this design. I need this. Um, You know, I'm trying to make boom, boom, a funner character and and give her more nineties clothes rather than Madonna's clothes. Um, But it's, uh, I do notice I, this is this is a go-to pose for Rob here. Um, I'm actually noticing this, whether it's Gideon with his hands out, okay, and then Cable does it. Uh, clearly, I am I am digging this this gesture, which honestly I'm now seeing going through it with you. Uh, this this hey man, yeah man, <laughs> and don't you get me? Um, <laughs> you know. Uh, is is something I'm I'm doing quite a lot in my layouts, but anyway, worth mentioning. I, I, uh, no, on the last picture we were looking at the Bart Simpson poster on the wall, you yes. know, to uh, sort of a photograph of time there. Although I guess the way the Simpsons have endured, you know, it's, it's almost. <laughs> oh, isn't, isn't that cool? Um, yeah, no, I just felt like you know, if I'm going to make these characters relatable, let's let's put some relatable stuff in there, and I obscured it enough that nobody got in trouble because if that would have. Uh, been a problem marvel would have yanked it um yeah i'm surprised you know, like that seems like something now that, that you know they seem very conservative to me marvel dc yes. like putting anything of that sort in i feel like would get flagged yes. now Here um, we, we need to we need to yeah we, we need to go back and we just need to make fun of that one page with all those giant books <laughs> oh well it's his artist editions <laughs> i mean it's like, looking at his artist editions man no no you, you gotta understand um yeah look, look at the, these are like these are like freaking giant encyclopedias. Anyway, I'm sorry about that. No, later on in, in, in 98, Bob, 99, Bob calls me when I have cable in a suit and with spectacles. And he, it, he actually did lobby for me to change that. Thought it was the wrong message. Thought he looked weak, like an old man. And I said, would you just trust me? I think he looks smart. But this is the first time we see more than cable at a console. He's starting to look through and I'll do it the next issue because I really want to sell the Reed Richards cables really smart as well, right? But boom, uh, again, this might be a million dollar page. And I know I, I don't want your people to be cringed about that. It's shocking to me. Yeah. Because I have, I have met people hunting this page. Sure. They have told me what they will pay for this page. Now, this page was sold in 2018. And the guy has told me he regrets selling it because of that cable page selling for a hundred. This sold for fifty six thousand, and he thought he was doing the right thing. Deadpool two is coming out. My, the, I'm I'm hitting the auction that's a couple of weeks before the movie, and I think he he told me because he lives here in Southern California. Oh, I I I, I this is over a hundred some now. I mean, look, it's hard for me not to see this because. All of my buddies and I, we buy original art and everybody's always, what would you go in on that? What would you go in on that? What would you go in on that? And just so you understand, like I've told people, like if uh, if X-Men 142, this is the true believer, but if this thing, I'd sell my family. <laughs> okay. I, 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 like it's never, Terry Austin has this. It's in his collection. He's not selling. But so we all think about obtaining now, but it's 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 like I said, you know, and there were art there were art dealers who insulted me 20 years ago. And we all know who the major art dealers are on. They're at all the major shows. And and he and uh I asked him if he wanted to sell my stuff a couple of years ago and he's like, 
Like, no, like what an insult that I would sell your stuff. Now he comes up to me, he goes, do you have any, do you have any of your, your art, anything you want to, I said, you said you didn't want me to sell myself. Whoa, your old stuff, man. Ho, ho, boy. I'm like, please remove yourself from my path. I, I need to keep walking. <laughs> Rob, um, do you remember selling this like back in the day or is this something that you had? All of for- it, yes, yes. And here's the thing, because look, um, Todd, the last time I was at his house, I think that's 2012. And he went and got the last cover that he has of New Mutants, which is uh, 85 with them, with Odin um, in the bed. And they're flying towards I didn't do the inside, I just did the cover. And Todd inked it. And John Romita Sr. decided our Odin, which looks badass, which you're never going to see. Because, again, going to like Zoolander and uh, files out of computer, you had two grown men looking at an 11 by 17 page thinking, how can we get that that Ramita senior hated our Odin face so bad, man. He put concrete between it. Like, <laughs> like it will tear the page to, to take it off. But, um, like Todd and I laugh, like Todd doesn't have any of his Spider-Man art. Jim doesn't have any of it. Jim held onto a few. I, 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 I have like, I have some new mutants art. It's just not, they're not great pages, but when you bid did work back then, the royalties from this wouldn't hit for a year. Marvel, it was a 12 month royalty. You had to wait so they could get interest on it. You know, Jim Lee would be like, man, they got paid for that in 60 days. And then they, they sit on it for 10 months. Well, that's what we signed. That's what we agreed to. Um, And so we would sell our art to make extra income. And I remember this is the period where like, guys, I'm getting like $400 for interiors. Dude, somebody offered me a thousand for a cover. Okay. We laugh about that because we know what that meant to us then. Yeah. I'm just glad that the people who have this, you know, I'm not part of that. Like this should sell for a million and law life should get a piece. Bullshit. I sold it. It's yours. Sell it for as much as you want. Keep all of it. I don't believe in that France. <laughs> Keep paying the guy that I don't, I can't even wrap my head around that. Okay. I, we sold it. We enjoyed selling it. We sold all of it. It helped pay the bills. But yeah, I remember selling all this stuff. I was always curious how how the the Sotheby's thing uh, ever c- comes around with with you and uh, Jim Lee when at at, at that height of uh, the speculator boom, like did Sotheby's come to you guys or did you guys create that pos- that situation for yourselves? All right, I'm gonna give you guys a story you never heard before. This is a, this is a banger. I haven't even talked about this on my podcast. That this is a banger of a story. Let me see if I have the one prop that I can get. Yep. Please be a sword. Nope. <laughs> Word. Okay. Staber home video. Paul. Uh, Paul Burke, who talked to us all in it, who owned Staber. And this is part of Todd. Because Paul and Todd... Look, Paul helps Todd start his toy company. Paul is the guy. Paul is, when he, when I meet him, he goes, I've painted bridges in Pittsburgh. I've, I painted the, the Steelers stadium. So he's from your neck of the woods. Um, I know, are you guys in Detroit, Pittsburgh? No, we're in Pittsburgh, yeah. Pittsburgh, yeah. So, so, so Paul comes out, gives, tells me, Rob, I have a painting company, construction company. I'm doing this, I'm going to do a production company. Well, we all get along really well. Paul likes me and Todd, but Todd, he likes Todd the most. They're, they get along the most. They're again, again, you guys got to remember, I'm, I'm six or seven years behind all of the image guys. I am legit younger. Okay. Yeah. Um, not at their maturity level at this time. And uh, Paul and Todd had really hit it on. And Todd was hyper competitive with Jim Lee. Don't think he wasn't. I got too many witnesses. <laughs> Todd calls me <clears throat> and says, Paul Staber wants to call you. Uh, but, but, uh, uh, Paul, Paul, Paul Burke wants to call you. I uh, got, got an inside tip. Old Jimmy saw selling his, uh, his X-Men number one to Sotheby's. Is, is that, is that something you'd be interested in? Uh, 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 uh Paul, Paul wants to talk to you. I'll talk to him. Paul Burke, Paul, who talks like this, <clears throat> Rob, 
I got a friend at Sotheby's that says Jim Lee is putting his X-Men number one. The deadline is next week. You'd have to have the whole job in and sign the papers. Is that something you're interested in doing? Because feels like wouldn't it be great to have your work in there too? I said, hot damn, yes it would. Here's where the story gets the best. And it was sold to, it was said to me through gritted teeth. And it was said to me by Mr. Jim Lee. But I told you we were out there for that Sotheby's auction, right? And Mark Silvestri was wooed by Todd during that weekend. And we all kind of went to a X-Men retreat and acted like we were interested, even though we we're like, we're out of here. <laughs> and that, and Peter David's like, I'm going to talk the whole time. And well, I, I, they're going to let me. Cause we're like, just keep talking, buddy. Keep Keep talking. This is your time. This is your time to shine. Um, Because we're like, I'm not doing anything more. And Jim's like, I'm not doing anything more. Well, I had to leave. And my, they hadn't gotten to my auction yet. And they hadn't gotten to Jim's either. And I got on the plane. My, my flight left around 6 o'clock. So I get home. I get home at 10 o'clock at night. So so I, I this is the gritted teeth is Jim Lee. I'll get to that in a minute. I get home. You guys remember answering machines, right? <laughs> answering machines are the best, okay? You have six messages. Last message. Hey, Rob, uh, Big Daddy, I uh, just, just wanted to call. Uh, the, the art sold for 50K. Uh, 50, I, I, I don't know, uh, 50K. Uh, same as Jim's, Jim X-Men sold 50K. To the same bidder, bud. To the same bidder. Uh, congrats, you sp you split the baby. Uh, <laughs> talk soon. I said, hot damn. So when I talked to Jim about it, he's like, yeah, the uh, same guy, he, he, he bought both issues. He So the same guy owns X-Men 1, owns the X-Force 2. I'm like, <laughs> to this day, that bothers him so much <laughs> because the presumption was he would have spent a hundred on gyms, right? But uh, so Todd, what a great question. I've never told that story. Todd McFarlane will 100% corroborate that even if we freaking hated each other. Paul Burke will corroborate that. The Sotheby, like that is the funniest shit. I, I like, dude, I was a little pawn on the, on the board sometimes. Dude, that was, that was Ross. That's Ross Perot shit, man. It's like, it's like, yeah. we need to get, we need to split up this Republican vote and get this other fella in there, man. Let's, <laughs> let's pump up Ross. The, the, um, you know, Todd really wanted our crossover to be in August against X-Men number one. It was the hardest I'd ever seen him go at Marvel. <clears throat> but Tom DeFalco goes, we're not doing it. It's not, our focus is X-Men number one. And that's why we siege uh, the, you know, X-Force 3, Todd's last issue, and X-Force 4 was bumped uh, to Jim's second issue. But Todd, Todd really, he's like, if we can get in there, we can blunt some of those. Look, you gotta understand, <laughs> Todd's, the guy, Todd's the guy that said, I think you'll do a mill, a mill on X-Force. I mean, what, what what the fuck is X Force? No, nobody knows. No, I, I know what an X Man is. So I think he was eating some. I think he's he. There were some bitter pills um, <laughs> that summer in 1991. Because <laughs> there's also history is attempting to be rewritten. I got five trading cards. Not a problem. I figure there's a million of these. In you know there's a. I was told million Deadpool, million Cable, million each card got a million. Uh, Todd wants to act like Spider-Man was one comic. It was not. No, it was four. It was four individual copies, marketed di differently. But anyway, back to this. Oh, hey, look, he sh he he throws a line out. I, like you got to shoot lines. Yeah, you got a lot it's of private. weapons, man. You got the you got the uh, cable arm that kind of shoots some shit. You know, that, you and I wanted to it. introduce that. And this, thank you for pointing that out. This is me going, there's more to Cable. He doesn't need to hold a gun. He could actually blast you with his arm, yeah. you know? Um, so you got the Deadpool line. There's there's all kinds of stuff going on here. I'm just trying to make him uh, as formidable as, as possible and able to anticipate and 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 mitigate each of these guys uh, and, and take them down. 
until he gets taken down himself. But uh, again, and I've said it a million times, you guys, I just, maybe in another universe, if Todd isn't taunting me all the time, how easy it is to draw, uh, you know, Spider-Man and do a full page and he's out playing with this kid, you know, while I'm still on panel one that morning, uh, there's, there's great truth in it. And when you say how he pops, I mean, red and black. I mean, I, I, this this is very much uh, a Spider-Man influenced, uh, you know, if, if you're talking to somebody every day and they're they're literally laughing, oh, you, you, he knows I'm drawing a team book. He's, he's still drawing that team book. Drawing all those eyes and that hair and measuring the nose and the mouth and the, and the stubble. It gets to you, man. <laughs> you're like hey i want to have some easy pages too boom <laughs> boom okay yeah it, 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 did, did this page was this page easier to draw hell yes yeah and that's when you like it's magic whole face masks <laughs> it's magic so yeah good stuff so at this time you know without the benefits of foresight or the future right what, what happens who are you trying to get over the most here cable or Deadpool? Well, I want to deepen. I've told people and, you know, I, this story, I go back to my interviews in comic scene, in wizard, in whatever I was talking to at the time. Huge, you know, influence of Star Wars here. Han Solo, Jabba the Hutt, uh, and Boba Fett. Cable has got people who are after him who have contracts out on him. So he's like Han Solo. He's got a past. It's going to catch up with him. Deadpool's coming. He's working for Tolliver. Tolliver is my big Jamba the Hutt. What no one knows, but I do, is because literally it is my last issue. And, and you know, I did one signing with the scripter in 2015. And right before we left, it was the same thing that Bob Harris told me. Rob, you, you played us all along. I had no idea. And, and the scripter said, I got to tell you, man, I, I really think the, the the biggest trick you ever pulled was was that Domino wasn't Domino the whole time. And I'm like, that's me watching Days of Our Lives in General Hospital with my, uh, my mom, my sister, my whole life, soap operas. So it's multiple, you know, uh, it, it's, it's multiple things I'm trying to achieve here. I'm trying to strengthen Cable. I am trying to give us a new dynamic character who, again... Marvel Age did an in, in uh, did an interview with me. I show it as often as I can because what are you going to do? You're going to go back in time and erase this interview? And they're like, "When is Deadpool coming back?" And I'm like, "Well, his he sl he slated to come back uh, in X Force number six. That's what we're bringing him back. As you know, he came back in X Force two, and that is because the mail on this issue alone demanded he be get, he be fast tracked. And that is when Marvel is like, "Look, we see the mail we're getting. Let's get this going." But no, I'm really proud of this issue just from a, like Jim said, character introduction and, you know, mailing him back because then that kind of cable's getting the last laugh here, but it was all a long game to get Domino back in the picture, snug as a bug on a rug into cables, you know, so we can get an even bigger betrayal. And 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 again, I, I know that she's, you know, being held at the bottom of a ditch um, and that Deadpool is going to be in on it. So like you're playing the long game with all this stuff right now. Just like, look, dude, if you think I was going to tell anybody who Stripe was, no way. Th Stripe had three identities. I did not disclose one of them. I had a year to work out which one worked the best for my plans. But, you know, had I told them, because uh, my editor didn't know until I sent him the last page of, of New Mutants 100. And that's when he was like, what? Are you serious? <laughs> and I think that's what drove when look when Robert Kirkman, upon meeting him in 2002, and Jeff Johns tells me in 2003 that like New Mutants 100 rocked their world, and that strife reveal was everything. I'm just happy as a creator, as a writer, as someone who was you know pulling the strings uh, that it that it works. You guys, you you write, you draw, you get it, you understand. We it's, were it's. We were there just the same, you know, like you get that issue 100, you see the, the cable face with the with the strife helmet. Uh, what is the lag? Because like, we were kids then, man, and it yeah. felt like 10 years from 
New Mutants 100 to X Force One. Horrible torture. Yeah. So, so what was the span of time in between? I mean, it was four four months. It's so crazy how that works. Yeah, that is a whole summer vacation. It is. Like yeah. For, for yeah. Did you? No, take... I mean, uh, you know, it, it 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 was faster than you think because it kicked off uh, the Mutant Genesis summer. We were we were first out the gate in June, and uh, the, the New Mutants 100 came out the last weekend of February. So it's like all March, April. May and then middle of June, you got your X Force, and uh, trust me, it was it was a big deal for me too, man. I was sweating it because, like I said, I knew I was. Uh, I I finally got look, man. Marvel Comics has uh, they they produce a lot of coffee table books. They may license them to other people, but you know it's always Marvel writers, Peter Sanderson, or the same author that's 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 doing the, you know, history writing, and there's a couple of them that say and Liefeld won his showcase and like I I wouldn't have written it that way but I've adopted that like you got to understand and I've talked to you guys before I'm also uh my 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 parents are dirt poor bills have crushed them my dad is sick I'm trying to build a better life for my whole family and get you know and chasing the Mark Silvestri model of success was something that we all rallied around. Todd talked about Mark a lot. When Jim got on the radar, um, you know, he became the focus of Todd. Uh, you know, I just knew that if I would outwork, out hustle, and but I, I needed to have complete control of the story to really ignite. And and so these this time in my history is really it's a sweet time for me. It's also very lonely. And and I, I mean Murad is pretty much the only person I interact with at this time for almost two and a half years because I informed all my friends, this is my time. If I blow this, I'm done. I missed all the movies, all the going, all the going outs, no girlfriend during this time, just me, my pencil. It was a wake up, you know, at 9.30 a.m., get to the office by 10, go home at 3.30, 4 a.m., like drive in the dark just get four or five hours as much as I could start the cycle. And, and cause it's like, I knew the opportunity I'd been given. And when you grow up loving the X-Men books and now you're making an impact on the X-Men books, it it's, it's kind of self-sustaining. It's all you need for, for a long period of time. Were you working the entire, like the time in between new mutants, 100 X-Force one, is that time being used to sort of work ahead and get future issues done? Or do you have to have the pencil down and do some sort of promotional thing for, for experts? Like what happens with, you know, those 120 days or whatever? You know, it's, it's like I am, X-Force has not come out yet, but I am going to Brooklyn to shoot the Levi's commercial. The numbers have come out. It's coming out. The com the commercial itself, which I shoot in May, will not air till September. I have got pages of X Force Three with me in the hotel room that I am inking uh, in May. So no, no, no. Marvel was really good. Like Rob, don't blow this. Let's take this time. And look, man, it's all I wanted to do. Like I like again. You you know. When you've got those, and they were like, Rob, it looks like we're at 3 million. It looks, uh, looks like we're at 4.2 million. Rob, it's, it's at 4.5. Like, Sven Larson's a very happy guy. And, and here's what, another thing you know, you need to know. He may have gotten bonuses. I know Bob Harris at that time, Marvel's editors got year on bonuses based on sales benchmarks. Uh, Bob made a huge bonus in 1991 based on the mutant genesis and X Force and X Men. No, they, they look, I was extremely focused and just getting those pages out and trying to keep pace. But yeah, I mean, the, I, I'm, these books are coming out monthly. X-Force, X, X, two, three, four, uh, maybe five is where I pull in Brian Murray and Marat for a few pages to help me. Right. And then, uh, then I go on another three issue run and then there's the Mignola issue. And then at that point, it's like images happening and things are starting to get crazier and I get Dan Panosian in for uh, finishes. But like, hey, had Dan Panosian been around two years earlier, maybe he inks X-Force number one. You know, 
at that point, the look that we were looking for, nobody else could give us. Scott Williams was the only guy, you know, um, we that 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 we were part of the changing of the inking and then the studio system just accelerated that and i i think extreme studios had the most inking impact or maybe our greatest legacy is the seven kick-ass inkers that we put into the universe uh but that that look that you know because I, I read the people will I, I did not know that the simpsons comic book had a one-page takedown of Rob Liefeld. Somebody shared it with me. I'd never seen it like two weeks ago. And uh, I'm a little dude standing on a table and it's all about X-Force and shoulder pads. And, you know, they're making fun of me. And, and, uh, and it talks about the line work and the, and the, in the certain line, the, the style of drawing. I mean, that was a thing that we kind of put into, we made happen, you know, the new style of inking and, and uh, I mean, I remember somebody going, how do you get those, uh, how do you get those, oh man, what's it called? We, we, they're all over this book, but you draw a line and then you, do, anyway. And some people would do them really mechanically and I forget what we call it. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, but there was, a, there was a, again, a, a line work. And of course we were informed by Barry Smith, Terry Austin, but we just made a crazy inking salad. But the lines, color wasn't as, as much of a factor you know, and again, I see with you guys how particular you are with your inking and your lines and your rendering and how you make sure that the color doesn't get in the way of the rendering. Color is, I mean, I have to tell my, can you put all the lines back in? Who told you to knock out every single, like, I'm going to diminish the rendering. So my paint swirl. No, 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 no. Can you put the lines back, please? Because I love how you guys really manage that people see the lines. And Color, computer color hadn't happened yet. So the inking line was everything. And so that, and that took up, that took up all the time. Here's a coda to, to, uh, to our two part conversation, man. Rusty, Skids, Danny Morningstar, and uh, whoever else, they're still on that Warlock ship flying. Uh, they're halfway three times around the world at this point. Rob, thanks. Hey. Thanks so much for joining us, man. You threw a bunch of, softballs up in the air and we're going to see what sticks in in the uh, forthcoming x-force comic thank you so much for uh taking the uh, way back machine with us man to, to take a look at this period of time super influential to future generations of cartoonists and the your memory is sharp on the subject dude the sotheby story is worth the price of admission it totally. is it's so dude uh, hey look i love you guys you guys are doing great work um, I'm, I'm so glad that you, uh, have, have, have created this, this platform for yourselves and, uh, thanks for having me. It was fun that all you had to do, Ed, was ask, I will walk through these books anytime. I had no idea they were going to go in this many directions. Jim, I see you smiling. I know you were entertained. I know it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. You know, it's, it's so cool to go through and see the behind the scenes of this stuff because we were there reading them. So to get that other perspective now is, is I think it's super valuable for comics history. So thank you very much for that, Rob. And you know, one takeaway that, that uh, I should have mentioned it when you said it, but when you were talking about you were coming up with all this stuff and Marvel kept saying yes, it's a testament to the editor that he recognized, hey, it's working. I may not understand it, but it's working. Keep going, Rob, um, because it doesn't always work that way. Yeah. And, and you know, well, it's important. Jim, and Jim, that's what I'm saying. And I've talked about it on my podcast that Chris Claremont did not want to look back. And he, he kept moving the X-Men further and further and further away from the greatest hits. And the greatest hits in every X-Men's fan in 1990 was still the John Byrne, Terry Austin stuff, okay? He had really doubled down in the Outback with Mark. And the, and that team and those stories are cool. Master Mold, Celine, um, all of the different... Inferno, in my opinion, is the greatest of all the X-Men crossovers, period. Because you had Walt and Mark just really shining. But Jim walks in and finally convinced... I, I think not Jim walks in, Jim talks to Bob Harris, who goes to Chris and says, we're going back to the Savage Land, the Hellfire Club, Magneto, Kazar, Zabu, the Imperial Guard, the Shi'ar. Nobody could pull Jim back and, I mean, pull Chris back to give the sequels. It was kind of a precursor of what we do now. We're going back to Jurassic Park. We're going back to Indiana Jones. 
fans want to revisit the greatest hits. And Jim was like anybody. And again, a testament. So Bob let me carve out my niche. And at the same time, over in the X-Men said, hey, Chris, Jim is important. We need to adhere to what he wants. And let's not take the four ladies out on a shopping spree this issue okay <laughs> jim wants to go back to the shiar the savage land and in that way jim won his showcase again i'm a big bob harris guy he's never done wrong by me he gave me my shot he believed in me and uh and ultimately i do believe he wanted this stuff to happen but there were elements that had to be either convinced or dismissed to let me get in there um and change this book and i'm still very like i said really takes a new perspective if you go back to read new mutants two years to me prior it's not the same book at all there's no it they don't even remotely re resemble you know themselves but uh so i'm just glad he gave me a shot and i agree with you it, it it's a great coach a great manager a great gm that that she has a vision he had a vision and th there's something to be said for that so yeah, I, that, I thank you for bringing that up that analogy of bob harris as gm is something i haven't heard before and it's really yeah. interesting considering that time period and everything that was going on so thank you thank you again rob thank you ed thank you jim before we split though just let the people know about the podcast yeah again i have a podcast um i just talk about comics and it's called Rob's observations it's on all the platforms seek it out hang out with me love to have you Excellent. Thanks so much for joining us, Rob. Let's do it again soon in the future. I'm out. <laughs>